Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today for relationship status, long distance, long winter. It's complicated. I'm joined by <laughs> Mr. Anthony Melchiori. Hello, sir. Hello, my favorite person. How are you? <laughs> I am good. I'm really excited because we have a lot of um, fun things to talk about today. Yeah, I was really excited to have you on my podcast the other day. It was so much fun. That was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. It was yeah. good to get all of those questions. I mean, you just you just realize everybody is kind of in the same place, no matter what the industry is. You know, yeah, I, almost, I almost kind of like joke when people like everybody seems to try to be getting an edge. I'm like, dude, where are you going? It's like it's like somebody <laughs> trying to run a marathon on a ship, dude. I'm gonna see you come back around this way in a second. <laughs> we're all on the same, you know. We're all on all the same. same. That's Earth, exactly right. right. Okay, well, let's have some fun first. So first of all, we have not talked about this, but I would like for us to talk about. Oh, that was yesterday. My wife helping me with my tie collection. So I think that you've been in a tie challenge, haven't you? Have you been trying to wear all of your ties? Yes, I wore every single one of them. And what's the final count then? Um, believe it or not, apparently my wife purged my closet without letting me know. <laughs> there's, I had a hundred, a couple of years ago, I had 156 ties. I counted only 89 ties yesterday. Okay, so, so here's my question. In the, the challenge, which was to wear every one of your ties, right? Uh -huh. Was there a day where you woke up and you looked at the tie and you're like, you're out because no, I don't, you no. you liked all of them. No, I don't like all of them, but I made a, a, <laughs> a commitment to wear every single one of them. And then and, it's, it's funny because I get some comments from some, some viewers saying, that doesn't look like you. And I was like, I know, that's why I never wear I it. I had to wear it. I had to wear I, it. I feel like this tie I'm wearing right now. Is not a tie I usually wear. Yeah, that is not a typical Anthony tie. You're yeah. right. I yeah. like it. Oh, it's called Hammer Made. I actually picked it up in the airport. When you go through the airport, there's some of these tie stores. This one's called Hammer Made. I never, I've never been there before. So I was like, you know what? Let me give this guy some business. And I, um, it was very nice. And yeah. it's, it's 100% handmade silk, apparently. Well, there you go. Yeah, well, so that's funny. So that was uh, that was me getting all my ties together because I've worn every single one of them. So they were a mess. So yes, that my wife helped me coordinate all. I have, believe it or not, in my in my bedroom, there's one, two, three, four, five closets. Guess who's got four of them? You. I got four of them. <laughs> I like them. My favorite ties that you wear are blue. Just just yeah. for the record. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Okay, and now I have some pictures of us. Oh boy. Okay. That okay, was so How old were you here? I was in the United States Air Force. I was in Honduras. That picture was taken in Honduras and I was um, 23 or 24. Okay. So here's a picture that I, I'm trying to like equal us out in terms of embarrassment. So here's a picture of me. You can tell that I grew up in the eighties. Oh no, that's cute. You're adorable. It's cute. It's cute. There's Is my brother and sister. Brother? Yeah, yeah. Brother and sister both. Um, okay, let's move on to more embarrassing fodder, though. Okay. Uh, that was in Amsterdam. Um, I was in a crane hotel, and the gentleman was trying to tell me that the area in the crane hotel, it's a hotel, it's only three rooms, and plus they have this, like, room, this catering room, like, uh, club, that people, kings and queens and princesses and uh, people, kids with black cards come and no one tell you, like once the steps go up and the elevator goes up, like whatever happens up in the crane happens up in the crane. So when he was telling me this, which I don't believe half the crap he was telling me, but, but, but when he was telling me this, I saw this wig on, on like a hat rack and I grabbed it. I threw it on my head. And I go, what's this? He goes, I told you crazy things happen on the crane. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting look. And unfortunately, I have a similar look. <laughs> I just would like to point out, this is when my dad would call me a rooster because I had my, you know, rooster bangs. Uh -huh. But I think it's a really similar kind of perm. You know, maybe we should try to recreate it sometime. Yeah, you, had it, you had it going on. Yeah, I did. I really, I mean. I like that, that sweater. That was my favorite sweater, a red sweater with black graphics. All right, that's enough of that. Okay. Are you ready for oh, 20 questions? My favorite part. But I only do 19, so you're just going to have to to roll with it. Okay. What is the last book that you read? Um, the last book that I read was um, the one, uh, Nike, uh, with Phil Knight. 
Nike World, I think it's called. Great book. Which do you prefer, cake or pie? Pie. When is the last time you took your clothes to the dry cleaners? Yesterday. What is your favorite movie? Life is Beautiful. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, how long can you plank? 10 minutes and eight seconds. Oh my goodness. That's my record for the gym. Yeah. I had no idea. 10 minutes, eight that's, seconds. That's amazing. Yeah. When's the last time you had ice cream? Yesterday. Vegan. Of course. Bagel or donut? Bagel. Come on. From Brooklyn. Me too. Me too. What television show did you love as a kid? The Jeffersons. When's the last time you worked out? This morning. Who was your favorite James Bond actor? Oh, Sean Connery. Come on. Of course. I'm glad you said that, Anthony. Did anybody else? If you had said something else, I would have had to subtract points. So my, I'm my, very... my, my, my wife's favorite person ever. Yeah. Um, white wine or red? Uh, don't like wine, but red. In Italy. Only Italy, because the phosphates in the U.S. just make me sleepy. Okay. But red, red or white, as long as it's in Italy. All right, just Italian wine. We'll just right. put, we'll just put that right. there. Um, when's the last time you went to the beach? It was the beach uh, Sunday. What's day? Monday. Yesterday. What is one place you haven't been but would like to go? Japan. What music are you listening to these days? Um, I'm not really not listening to so much music anymore. I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, but um, 70s. Uh, on Sirius, uh, Channel 7, the 70s. Casey Kasem. Oh, my God. Top yeah. 10. Yesterday, I was listening to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this makes you happy, right? Yeah, it makes me real happy. Um, when is the last time you were on an airplane? Um, I was on an airplane two weeks ago, coming home from Vegas. Okay. What is the last meal you had in a restaurant? Um, the other night at the Rockaway Hotel, I had fish. Okay, three more. What is one thing on your bucket list? Japan. What is the last movie you saw? Um, I just watched something on Netflix about the comedy store in uh, LA. Oh, that sounds good. Very good. Okay, last one. Cannoli or tiramisu? <sighs> Come on, Brooklyn kid. <laughs> I worked at a store called Cap uh, Cappuccino on the Bay in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, and they had the best cannolis to this day. I still can't find a better cannoli. Yeah, it's hard to find a good cannoli, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Thank you for Thank sharing you. with us. Thank you. Um, okay, let's talk about our roadmap today. So I want to do a State of the Union because things are kind of um, crazy town right now. And then I want to talk about long distance, long winter. It's complicated and as always give you some resources. So let me do the State of the Union. It's a little bit different than it is previously because before when we've talked, we've been talking about kind of what the campus is gonna look like. Now there's a lot of other things going on. So a couple of things that I wanna point out for you. First of all, some schools are using this opportunity to either freeze tuition or do a tuition reset. So the average cost for like a four-year private institution is about $37,000. And so you see a lot of schools that are saying, hey, because we're not doing what we um, normally would do, we're gonna reset our tuition. We're gonna do a freeze on tuition. Although not every school, some schools are still raising tuition. Um, you my, have- my daughter, my daughter's school raised the tuition. Did well, they? Uh -huh. um, a lot of schools are raising it two to 3%. Yeah, they raised it 3%. And so ready, um, let's put it this way, double, the number you just came up with. Yeah, so that is a big thing happening right now in the industry. People are trying to figure out what to do about that. Paying $60,000 for my kid to take uh, class online. Online classes, that's exactly right. A um, hundred public and private schools are being sued right now for tuition refunds. So parents are saying, we're not gonna pay that. We want our money back. You did not deliver what you said. Um, also, two other interesting facts. So of schools with more than 5,000 students, only 25% of them are doing random or surveillance testing. So that's where just at random times they pick out students and do testing for them. Only 6% are doing regular routine screenings of students. So 6% of schools are doing regular routine. Wow. So um, that's really interesting to me. And I think a lot of those schools are smaller so they just feel like they don't have the resources to be able to do that testing. There was a really interesting article today in, the, uh, in NPR about smaller school advantages, how because 
they are able to kind of better control their student body. Um, they're able to have some advantages over these really, really large. Yeah, yeah. My daughter, my daughter's, uh, there's three schools. So one in the city is closed only online. One um, is in Westchester, small, pretty controlled. She's on the volleyball team. One person ha had contracted it, um, but nobody else did. They shut it down, then they opened it up. Good. The other one's got about 50 cases throughout the whole school, to a little, little larger school. Um, but they've kind of controlled it and they, they do, my daughter's been tested like eight times. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. I, I'd say half the time was her on her own. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I will say, you guys, is if you did not read this article in the Atlantic, I think it was on the 20th. So maybe like last Friday, it is really, really good. It's about how higher education is about more than, um, school. So let me read you a quick quote out of this. It says classes are still happening, but degree and degrees will be conferred. Parents and teachers are myths because they don't really buy teaching when they pay tuition. Instead, they get something more abstract, the college experience. Most of the college experience doesn't happen around education. It's the stuff that can't be done from a distance, such as moving away from home for the first time, touring houses during sorority rush, applying face paint for a football game, decorating in the cold and cinder block walls of a new dorm room. So if you have not read that article, you guys, I would encourage you to. It's a really good look at kind of why colleges are doing what they're doing and the position they're, they're in. And I think Rachel's gonna chat that link. Um, the other thing, Anthony, that's coming up is this uh, November challenge. And we're gonna do a poll. If you're attending, I would really love to hear what you guys are planning and doing in November. So there's a couple of choices. Some schools are sending students home for Thanksgiving and then they're just staying there and doing online classes. Some students are going home and then coming back to campus and just doing kind of what they have been doing, whether that's online or hybrid. Um, and then some schools have accelerated their classes so that they're actually done in November. So they'll send them home in November and then they won't come back, they'll, they'll have a break. Yeah, I have um, one, two coming home and not going back and one uh, going, uh, coming home, actually she's home anyway. And after the holiday, she's going back and then she's done. She's graduating college six months early, so she'll be done. Yeah, so Anthony, that is a trend that we are seeing in so many schools. Juniors from last year and this year are like, we're just gonna get this done so that we can graduate because there's no telling what's gonna and happen. She was on track to graduate anyway because high school she did so well, so she was already on track. But you know, it's good and bad because what's she gonna do for six months? You know, yeah. she's, she's an actress, she wants to be on Broadway. And she was working in clubs on Broadway. And now, so yeah, there's a lot of um, uncertainty, but she's, um, she'll graduate six months early. Yeah. So most of our schools, it looks like, are going to go home and stay home and then do online classes after Thanksgiving. And you guys, the other variable that I'm curious about is what you're going to do for spring. So some of our schools are pushing back. Um, they're opening until later in January. February 3rd. My daughter I was going to say, some schools are even pushing it back to February. So I'm really curious for you guys. The other variable is how quickly are you bringing back students um, in the spring? I'll say about this November challenge that you have a bunch of disillusioned students who came for the fall. It was not the experience they wanted. They were masked up. They were on Zoom, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and now is the first opportunity where you're going to send them home, which kind of forces a decision for them. They've got to decide what they're going to do and how they're going to approach the rest of it. Um, looks like most of you have a normal, so you're going to bring them back in, in January, although a couple of you are delayed until February. So the problem with this November challenge is that you have a huge gap from Thanksgiving break all the way, in some cases, till February, where students are disconnected and they're not super happy with their experience that you they had on, on the campus. Um, and so one of the things I want us to talk about today is what are we going to do during that time to keep students really close and, and connected to us? Because it's going to be, I think, really difficult. Yeah, that's interesting because my daughter is very concerned because all of them, they're looking at me going, hey, can you get me a job for two months? I'm like, I don't know. Right. That's right. What are they going to be doing for two months? They're freaking normally, out. Yeah, 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 normally, even just a month. I mean, my parents were like, you need a job for a month. We got to figure out what you're going to oh, do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm <laughs> like, you're going to be home for two months, all three <laughs> With no school, and you're just going to all be here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of, um, well, I, I have a lot to say about that. I want to talk about it. So let's talk about our, I got very artistic with our um, title today. 
long distance, long winter, it's complicated. And I want to break down every part of this. This is very poetic to me. Anthony, do you like poetry? I love poetry. You do? We had an office poll going about like a, a everyone was guessing. I couldn't quote poetry, like like my favorite poet or, but I, when someone reads poetry to me, like it is like, it, like just, I escape. So yeah, well done poetry or, or from the heart, even bad poetry from the heart. I love poetry. I, that makes me very- I love the spoken word. I'm not really good at the spoken word, but I love it. Yeah. Um, so I want to break down each of these pieces because it does feel like poetry. But first of all, I want to, I, so there is an episode of Hotel Impossible that I want to talk about for each three of these pieces. I think these things are woven through. But first I want to talk to you about something that I noticed when I was doing research for this. So can we just talk about, this is season one and season two. You look so happy to be doing the show. You look so calm. You look like in good humor. Season three. Okay. <laughs> Tell you about this. Do you want to know the backstory? I do. Okay, we're in the studio now. When you do these advertising shots, they they spend a lot of money. They had the best photographers. They had they had all these travel channel people there, and I'm already kind of established. I'm already four seasons in. I've already got another, another show picked up, and like so, I'm asserting myself at this point. It's like I'm not doing this. <laughs> And they're like, take this foam thing and break it over your thing. And I'm like, because all this is a foam board and they superimpose the hotel thing. And I'm like, I'm not doing it, period, end of story. Like, I'm not an angry guy. Like, you're taking this thing and you're making it something it's not. Right. So by the end of the day, like, I, I wouldn't do it. I, I did everything else they wanted me to do, like a, little, like a little puppet. I did everything else they wanted me to do and I was okay with it. And the guy was so nice. The director was so sweet. Not my regular director, a guy who was directing this. He was so sweet and so honest. I literally picked up the phone board and I said, give me that effing thing. And I did it. <laughs> right? Little did I know they actually caught it. <laughs> but I did it just for him. But I didn't think they would use it. And they used it. And I was so pissed off. They used it. Well, I appreciate that because seriously, when I was doing the research, I got to that picture. And I was like, that is so not Anthony. Right. And that's, so and the, president, the president of the Travel Channel actually sent a note saying, that's not him. Why are we using that? <laughs> because it's not me. Like, if, if, any, if you watched my the show for the nine years it was on, I'm, I'm an expert at de-escalating. I'm not right. an expert of escalating. Right. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, that makes me feel much better because I was a little concerned. Like, yeah, what was, was going on? That. It's so funny that you nailed that because that, that really pissed me off. Okay. So here's the show that I want to talk about. Oh, wow. I got a real good backstory, but go ahead. Do you remember this one? So I, this I'm going to cry at some point. This is at Bailey's Harbor, Wisconsin, um, which I love. It's called the Cape Cod of the Midwest, which yep. who knew that existed, right? Unbelievable it's, place. It's, it's the beachfront inn. It was beautiful. It's like you said, they had so much to offer. Um, the, only, of only, the only hotel, that picture does not do the beach justice. The, the, um, it's the only hotel in that area that has access to the beach. Wow, amazing. So I wanna start off, um, can we just talk about, first of all, it's a pet friendly, friendly hotel, which is what they do. When you, when you came, you um, stepped in, a pile of dog poo. Yep. To which, when my daughter watched that, she was like, "Oh, that is gonna make him mad. <laughs> Not a good start." Yeah, and that wasn't um, bad. It was just more like, "Really?" Right. Right. Exactly. So I want to talk about this, but first, I want to take a little side trip, and that is this process for getting reservations that they had, because I feel like <laughs> I feel like it's really similar to what. Where do you get these pictures from? <laughs> Did you snap the, did you, did you take a picture of the video? Yeah. Wow. They're really good. Like, wow. They're I've never seen that before. Uh, Cause I was looking at her like, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. So her process was you go online and you make a reservation. Then she gets an email. Then she opens her email and goes to another system and copies and pastes it in. Then she writes it down in this book and this, uh, I think, yeah, this is her res reservation book, right? And you timed her and it took her like four minutes. You said, I'm from New York. I'm extraordinarily impatient <laughs> for this process. But I wanted to talk about it because 
so many things in higher education are this like chaotic, just stop and get the right technology so that you are not spending forever to, to manage this process. And there was another scene where we show you the right process. And the reason I, I, I get emotional talking about this young lady is because her and I didn't get along in the beginning. Like I was, I was over her, she was over me. And I didn't want to deal with her. I thought she was crazy. She thought I was crazy. And at the end, we fell in love with each other. It was like, and, and she stays, she stays in touch with me until this day. She tripled her revenue once we gave her systems. Wow. I told her, you are the only place in this area that has a beach. You are shooting fish in a bucket. And you remember that scene I did with the cards? And I said to her, if you do this, she goes, everybody's going to be mad at me. I said, yeah, they're going to be mad at you. And then next season, they're all going to love you because you're going to increase the rates. You're shooting fish in a bucket. Yeah. It's the only place in town on the beach. It's beautiful. Everybody comes here. It's Cape Cod of this area. Boom, 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 boom. She tripled the money. But this was the, this was the, this is not really relevant to what we're talking about. But since you brought it up, um, I'll just tell you that her sister sent me a letter. Somehow it got to me. And um, apparently we saved her life. Apparently she was in a really bad place. And right before we got there, she was, it was not good. I'll just say that. And her sister went out of her way to send me a letter saying, you saved my sister. Wow. And that, that like, like to this second, I, I could cry about it. It's like, wow, I went in there to help her with a hotel. N never did I know that things were that desperate. And she was that far gone as far mm -hmm. as her mental state. And um, again, we, all we did was put in systems and she made triple the money. She sold the place for a lot of money. And now she's in the marijuana business. <laughs> <laughs> that was a surprise ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that because that, um, you know, if you never accomplished another thing in your life, that's a worthwhile thing that you did, right? Like, yeah. anytime I get, I get very fortunate to be in a position where I get a lot of um, feedback, especially from kids. Um, and I want to go to the hotel business. And like, that's why today was so emotional to see that young lady on my podcast. Um, she was a young lady going to Cornell and she was in this competition. She won the competition. She's getting $50,000 for a real estate deal um, to buy a hotel. And it was just, it was just beautiful. And so, yeah, I, I, if anything, I, I'm blessed because I get to be in a position to see these beautiful things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I wanna talk more about them, but I wanna put it in context of long distance because you remember with them, there's a lot of long distance going on. Okay. Let me talk about it in terms of what's happening on our campuses. So for our students, whether you were in person, online, or whether you kind of had a break um, and you will have a break in the in November, everyone was um, long distance, right? We all had masks, we weren't spending time together. We are in a place where we are socially disconnected, where it is hard to find community, where it's hard to engage with each other. Um, and as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about it in terms of like a literal long distance relationship and kind of the phases of a long distance relationship. So if you think about, Anthony, have you ever been in a long distance relationship? Say that one more time. Have you ever been in a long distance relationship, dating relationship? Yeah. <laughs> They're awful. Yeah. Um, uh, she got back from Italy and she showed me a picture of all of her friends. And I said, you dated him while you were in Italy, didn't you? And she started to cry. And I was like, I'm okay. Whatever. <laughs> we broke up. And then six weeks later, she calls me. She goes, you didn't even fight for me. I said, I don't fight for anyone. Yeah. We're still long friends to this day. We're still friends. She married a billionaire, so she's doing okay. She's doing okay. Well, long <laughs> distance relationships are terrible. And here are the stages I think you go through. So you're separated from each other. You're idealistic. You're kind of longing. You want it to be the way it was. Remember, we got to be together every day and it was so wonderful, right? This is kind of where students were when they came back to school in the fall. They were just like, oh my goodness, you sent us home. We can't wait to be back together. It's going to be so nice. Super idealistic. You're my clear choice. I value you. I'm committed to you. I cannot wait to come back, right? And then when they come back and it's not exactly as they ima imagined, or even their separation is they're on campus, but they can't be with their friends or you're online or whatever. They're just like resigned. You know what? It's not going to be different than this. Like this is where we are right now. We are far away from each other. We are not spending time together. We are not doing the things that are going to be fun. And there's nothing to be done about it. This is just the way that it's going to be. And it's boring to learn online, period. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so that then translates into a bunch of students who are weary and lazy and lonely. You know, when you've been gone from your long distance partner for so long that you're just like, this 
is awful. And I don't want to show up and I'm lonely and I don't want to do this anymore. And I think that's where our students are. Yeah. Um, I think that's maybe where we are a little bit in terms of yeah, like, I just, can. you know, I'm so glad I'm working with you guys because I have three kids going through that. everything you just said. I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, it's exactly where my children are. Yeah, that's right. And the problem with weary and lonely and lazy is that first of all, you get to that place when you don't feel like you're being pursued, right? When you're like, they're not showing up for me. We haven't talked in a week and nobody cares about it. We're because we're in this place of long distance relationship. There is no one who is pursuing me and trying to figure out what's going on. And I'll tell you of every, I think 90% of the questions that I got for this session were about how do we motivate and engage students? And I was like, I wish I had the magic bullet for that. I have it. I have it. You want oh, it? What is it? Yes. You. Hi, student. How are you today? <laughs> Pursue them. Right. I see you. How are you? What's going on? Nothing. Come on. Nothing ain't going to work. You're not getting off the phone with me until something. How was the ball game last night? How are the Jets doing? What's going on? It's like, this sucks, man. This sucks for me. It sucks for you. It sucks for everyone. Yeah. You're spending a lot of money, you know, trying to make this work. You guys are spending a lot of money to be here. I know this sucks. Come on. You don't have to tell me how you feel, but I just want to let you know I'm here for you. You know, here's my cell number. Give me a call. You know, man, we're, we're here for you. This sucks. And I wish I can change it. If nothing else comes out of that, you see the person. Yeah, that's right. And I like that because what we're always saying is often you cannot solve the problem, but you can see you the can't. problem. You right? can't. Right now, right now, I want to, like, I am so desperate to solve what's going on in, with the election, what's going on with my kid's school, my yeah. door, door by being closed. I'm in a place right now that I feel useless. And because I'm a fixer, it's what I do for a living. Right. It's what I do. My, my daughter went to college. She goes, Dad, I'm learning to fix things myself. Like the other day, she had to get something done. And I go, how'd you get that done? She goes, I did an Anthony. So like, <laughs> like she was, she's so used to me getting shit done or stuff done for her. Yeah. Um, that, that, uh, but she had to do it for herself. So I want to fix things. And so all parents, students, teachers, faculty, everybody's frustrated. There's nothing we can do to fix it right now. Right. right. So yeah, that's right. Just showing up and saying, Hey, I see you. And this is really hard. So I want to, um, the last piece is considering alternatives, which is the place that we want to keep students from. Because for your institution, if you are not pursuing your students, they're considering alternatives. This is where when your girlfriend goes to Italy and you're like, I'm lonely and I haven't seen her, you start looking around like, well, who else is there that I can She, she found an Italian guy, I didn't find anybody. <laughs> that considering alternatives is the place where in a long distance relationship it breaks because you start thinking you know this is not what i signed up for this is i don't love this right. um so it brings me back to this couple which you remember one of the complications was he was a long-haul trucker oh i remember and i just have to tell you she i i in the end i love her she really is precious she was rough in the beginning Mm -hmm. um, a couple of quotes that you'll remember. So first of all, her husband said, Hey, I heard you were really rough on my wife. And she said, I, th he thought it was funny because he feels like he, she finally met her match. And he said, if I argue with her, she usually wins. And you said, really? And he said, yeah, she's always right. And you said, she's always right. And he's like, yep. And then she said, but I usually am like, she's like, no kidding. I am the right one. I don't know what we're talking about here. Also, he said, being apart is the glue that keeps us together. Right. right? He yeah. was like, I go on the road because it's very hard to work with your spouse. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of long distance, like not good communication, feeling really lonely. And you, this is another one where you're like, I'm not a counselor, but um, we got to fix this. And so I convinced him to stay at home and invest. Right. And, and yeah, and, and there was, I don't know if we said it on camera, um, but I went to her and I was very frustrated, not with her, but I, I got to break this. I got, there's something, this wonderful, spirited, beautiful woman is broken inside. And, and it's not about her husband. It's not about the place. She's fixated on cleanliness. She's fixated. She did a beautiful job. It was like, what's wrong? Her husband's a beautiful man. There's nothing wrong with her husband. What is wrong? And I looked at her and I don't know if this made the, the show or not, but this is what her, her, her sister said changed everything. And talk about being seen, right? 
here I am, this hotel guy comes in with a bunch of camera crews. You see me, but she sees all my producers. She sees everybody. Wow. And I looked her in the eye out of nowhere. And I just said, and I was so careful because I was so afraid. And I looked her in the eye and I go, why are you so sad? And she looked at me and she bursted out crying. And she said, no one has ever called me on that. She goes, I am desperately sad and I don't know why. And you're the only person to recognize that. That's wow. what it was. And once I said that to her, she knew I loved her and she knew I cared about it. And she knew I don't give a damn about the show or ratings or fixing your business. It's like, you're broken. And if you're not broke, if you're not fixed, we have a problem. And that one little, I see you changed everything. So if I'm with a student and I see something and they can be talking, 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 and I'll stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. you are horrifically sad yeah and, and i know because i am sometimes why how can i help you so so catching people yeah. when they're not expecting it and saying something that's scary because it was scary to say that to her yeah. because who the hell am i to come in and tell her she said who the hell am i to say that i mean that's disrespectful almost so anthony that's really interesting to me because that's a counseling technique and if you've ever had it done to you i've had it done to me twice in my life where i didn't know what i was feeling and somebody looked at me and said, you feel this. And I both times was like knocked backwards. Like, oh my gosh, that is what I'm feeling. I had no idea. No one has named that for me before, right? So just being able to look at a person and say, here's what I see. And if you're right, it does just open up the walls for them to be able to be honest because you taught them something that they they were like resisting, right? And I think also when, what it does is, it, it, it makes them understand that they're being transparent when they're trying to hold back, right? I'm real good at nobody ever knowing my feelings. I'm real good at that. Yeah. There's one or two people maybe on earth that can maybe penetrate a little bit. So as a person that's pretty closed off myself with emotions of how I feel, I'm very open to everybody else's. When somebody does say something like that, it makes me like, thank you. It's like, thank you so much for taking the time to cut through all the crap to realize, you know, I am not okay. Yeah. And so, yeah. so you immediately align with that person, whether it be a teacher, faculty member, you know, it's like, it, it, especially a person that shows up out of nowhere that you think is a TV star and then all of a sudden cuts through the crap. I mean, it was so powerful. Yeah. So a faculty member, a teacher, someone that like you, like, you know, you know, they have like 20 people they have to talk to. And then all of a sudden they say something that because you're really listening. And, and if somebody says to me, well, what's, and you know better than me, you're, you're an expert at this, but what's the technique? And the technique is just look people in the eye and listen. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, I like that because one of the things that we've been thinking about is the reuniting in a long distance relationship. And that's exactly what you're saying is like, when you get to the place where you can be close to them, not, not like literally, but where you can look at their face and see what's going on with them, that reuniting, when you say, Hey, I see you and I want to be close to you. And I want to know really what's going on with you is really powerful. And I think our schools have to be making plans for how to do that well with students and make sure that students feel like they're seen. Okay. Let's move on to long winter. This one's a little depressing, so I don't want to spend very much time here, but let me just say, um, first of all, we've not done COVID in the winter. We were lucky enough to have it happen after spring. There's a lot of just general depression in the winter because it's darker and colder. Um, we, I have friends who moved from a dark, cold place like last week to Arizona because they were like, we do not want to do COVID in the winter in the dark. And so I think we have to be very concerned about our students uh, in terms of COVID in the winter. I also would remind you guys that in the rhythm of the academic year, here's everything that's happening November to January normally. So these are all the work that you would be doing normally. Students are getting midterm grades and are not feeling confident about them. I promise you, especially this semester when everything's topsy-turvy and we're not doing our best work, they're not gonna be thrilled with their midterm grades. We're trying to get our freshmen to register for their sophomore year. They have not had a great experience. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do around speaking a vision for being part of our community in the future for freshmen. You will send them home for Thanksgiving and then they'll have final exams. So they'll be doing those not on campus, not with places to study, um, and also getting those grades back 
from those exams and then their final final grades. A lot of students are going to be on academic probation, so you need to revisit your policies for academic probation because the strictness of who is going to come back on academic probation and what that looks like is going to be really overwhelming for students. I think you're going to have students who normally would do a great job who are going to fall on academic probation and feel very ashamed of themselves and like they don't want to come back to school because obviously they're not doing a good job. So you have to control that narrative um, for there. And then also think about January. If you're delaying until February, usually in January, we get to start again. We get to teach, you know, have this whole narrative of like, hey, now we're starting again. It's a new semester. You can do well. We're not going to have that together. We're going to postpone that until maybe even later into February. So there's just a lot of work this winter that we normally would be doing that is going to be even harder um, because of where we are kind of in the- can I, can I ask a question as being a layman? Yeah. Shouldn't there be something different this semester where there's not an academic probation? You call it something else, you know, um, academic support. Yeah. Where, where you almost don't let them go on academic probation and there's a team or a few people around that person to really get them over the loop and kind of give them a break, you know, give them a curve and don't put, especially if, listen, if they were screwed up the whole time, you know, for, for two years, that's different. Yeah. But if they're a kid that was doing well, now they're on academic probation. I mean, is there leeway to kind of put them, you know, academic support? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the right thing. I think you look at your policies and you just say, this is, we don't, everything is different. We're going to have to do this in a really different way. I think my daughter can, who's never, got, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm no, sorry. No, go ahead. My daughter who's never got a B in her life, got a B minus or something on the, on the test. And I was like, uh, she goes, I got a B minus on the test. I was like, okay. She's like, yeah, that's how I feel. Okay. Like, I'm not upset. She's not upset. It's like, come on. I just, yeah. that you're getting up and doing it and it, we're working through this. It's like, I'm going to get mad at my kid for getting a B minus and she's never gotten a B in her life. Yeah, that's right. A lot of our schools are doing like an asterisk COVID year, which is just like all bets are off. We're just doing the best that we can. I know a lot of schools have changed to pass fail. So they're giving some students yeah. some leeway there. But yeah. I agree with you. I think that is a place where for student success, I mean, we want to speak like, hey, everyone's having a hard time, but also for retention, if you want your students to come back, you better make it clear no one is doing their best work and we're in this with you, not shame on you, you shouldn't have done this, and if you do it again, we're going to throw you out, right? So I think that's exactly right. Listen, if you're doing your best work now, um, you know, you're probably um, a mathematician or computer scientist. Yeah. That's right. I yeah. Because that means you like you like sitting in front of a computer <laughs> doing nothing but working. But if you're in the hospitality industry, I can certainly tell you I'm not doing my best work. Listen, Anthony, I as I'm looking for these pictures, you know, that we start off with, and I'm looking through your Instagram and I'm looking at like a year ago, the difference between all the places that you were traveling and then now. <laughs> Which I'm grateful for your beach pictures. They calm me, but but the the comparison, I was like, oh my goodness. You yeah, my, 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 yeah, we're we're we're, we're posting all. And most of those pictures were within the last 24 months, so we're just posting those just as like like to get people excited about travel. Yeah, yeah. That's and it actually, it, it actually showed. When I look at that, I go, have I been to that many places in like a couple of like? It's absolutely insane because I feel like I've been home a lot too. So. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And we've, we've been very, very fortunate. And um, uh, things are happening for another show. So I'll, it's really, we're, we're, there's a big meeting Thursday. Of course, nice. Okay, I'll put it on the calendar. Remember to ask you about that. Okay, a couple other things that I think our schools should be doing. I really would like, I don't want for this long winter to just stretch into oblivion and go That's from- depressing. <laughs> right. From Thanksgiving break until January. This is not the picture we want to be painting for our students, right? So here's everything that's gonna happen in this break. And I would be crafting communication around each of these pieces so that instead of feeling like it's this winter expanse, we can say, you are gonna have Thanksgiving. You normally have Thanksgiving. It's a celebration. Here's the language around that. You're gonna go back to your online classes. Then you're gonna take your finals. Then you're gonna have your final grades. Then we have Christmas. That's a celebration. You usually have a month off for that. Here's what we have to say. Then you're going to have New Year's. That's a celebration. We're going to be out of 2020. Thank God. We're going to move on to another year. 
then you're going to come back to campus. And I think you have to break down this long winter into these pieces. I agree. Yeah. So that they have a distinction between, oh my gosh, we're not coming back to school until February versus it's Christmas. That's what we're doing right now. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I'm already thinking that like, what are we going to do to really kind of keep this keep everybody busy so absolutely yeah. and, and 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 that's kind of how I, I'm breaking things down myself to keep myself sane it's just like okay get to next week next week we're going to do this actually I'm doing my podcast all week next week uh, from Washington DC going oh. to three different four different hotels and then we're then I'm going out to Ohio to do something for Cintas, then I'm going to Vegas and I'm like okay so I'm trying to keep myself looking forward to stuff yeah I think we did this for the summer. At least I know I did for my eight-year-old. I was like, you're in second grade. Now we have the end of school. Now it's summer. It's exactly the same, but we're going to think of ways to think about it like summer instead of. Especially, especially if people aren't traveling because everybody's happy when they're, when they have a vacation in their name. So what, what I'm suggest what I'm suggesting for myself and, and, you know, travel, like you can do this safely, just travel, like take that little vacation two hours away, an hour away, now go to a hotel in your neighborhood that just opened up and, and take a night or two nights. But we've got to we've got to give ourselves um, we got to give ourselves dessert. I had you know you asked me when last time I had ice cream. Um, I had ice cream before lunch yesterday again. I just wanted to. Yeah. Actually, I, I had ice cream instead of lunch yesterday. <laughs> I get to go to Florida next week for business. My oh, first trip since February. Yeah. So where? I am very very happy. Where where where? Orlando. Okay. Are you going to be near Tampa at all? Uh, I don't think so. My friend just opened a beautiful Mexican restaurant in Tampa. Oh, really? He's going to be on the show in a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Okay. So give yourself dessert. You've got to like figure out how you're talking to your students about all of those different fun little things that were fitting into the winter um, timeline. Also, Anthony, you had this quote today and I really, today or yesterday, I really loved it. And I want to talk about it for a minute because um, if you think, about the idea that we want to be inspired right um but we also have to figure out how to build a foundation i, I just I, I i knew that's the one you were going to pull up i, I love it to, yeah back so, down off the inspiration and stop building a foundation so can you um, talk about it for a minute yeah, back down from the inspiration, uh, from, from the motivation, and, and really what the quote is, is back down from the inspiration and work on the discipline, right? There's another quote that I, I sent out. And basically what I'm saying is, I don't wake up every morning, especially now with COVID, like feeling motivated. I don't. So I depend on my discipline. I depend on like this morning, my trainer wasn't coming until 10 o'clock and I was like, okay, so I'm going to give myself a little extra time uh, to relax. Um, and, uh, I gave myself that time Instead of getting up to try to make myself busy work. I was like, you know, I have a million things to do, but I'm going to give myself time. I went, I worked out, felt better. And now I'm busy till seven o'clock tonight. Um, but this morning I, I had to depend on my discipline, not my motivation. And I think so many people get that wrong. Like people are like so motivated. Most people aren't that motivated. Right. The majority of people given a billion dollars in a bank account, you know, and, and a yacht are going to take that and go to the Bahamas. Right. <laughs> Most of it is a necessity. We have to pay our bills and feed our families. So you're not always going to be motivated. So discipline, and I take my own advice on a daily basis, is really critical. Like I did something yesterday. I had to work on some financial stuff for my account, and I didn't want to do it on a Sunday. And I was like, I'm going to fix my tie collection with my wife, and then I'm going to sit in my office, and I'm going to do it. And I did it. I didn't want to do it. But I didn't, I didn't depend on my motivation. I depended on my discipline. So I think that that's a very important quote, especially for now. And I really think that it's like you and I were talking about last Monday, that we are trying to do student development and teaching students that is part of the responsibility of higher education. That yeah, look say, for another quote, so I'm listening to you. I'm just looking for another yeah, yeah, no. That we say, hey, it's not always going to be easy, but you have to build this foundation of discipline so that then you can show up. Absolutely. And this is the kind of time where you, here's another quote that I, I, I was two o'clock in the morning, I was up and I was like, how do I feel? And this is, this quote just came to me and it says, being good is worse than being average because you are so close to being undeniable, but you settled. Like you came into COVID being good and you were working to greatness and somehow you let COVID make you settle 
and get depressed or get upset. It's like, you're so close. Don't let COVID yeah. make you average or good. It's like, you're undeniable. Get there. And like, yeah. so I have to say that to myself on a daily basis. It's like, dude, I didn't come this far to just come this far. That's right. You also said during one of our first meetings, like, I want to be proud of myself at the end of this, yeah. which I think is so motivating, right? Like, I want to feel like I did a good job through this, which I really right. like. And I wasn't perfect and I didn't, you know, but I did the best I could and I pushed myself and I depended on my discipline and I depended on, like, I've done a good job in my career, you yeah. know, like that I'm proud of my career, of what we've accomplished, me and my teams, but that's not, that's, I'm not even close to where I want to be. You know, and yeah. so why am I going to let COVID push me back? And, and some days it's really hard. And it's, you know, what, what we kind of, I don't mean to go off on a tangent here, but what I don't like when people look at Instagram or look at their celebrity friends or look at people that they see, it could be a friend down the block that has a nicer car, a nicer house. It's like, everyone's got a story. You know, everyone's got a story. Everyone's suffering yeah. in one way or another, whether it's COVID or something else. And the only thing that's going to get to your goal is your path. Right. You know? and, right. And your path is very, very unique. And more than ever, we've got to stay focused on our path. That's right. So I have another quote for you that this one reminded me of you a lot. It's be impatient for action, but patient with outcomes. And I wanted to think about this in terms of the, that one. yeah, the idea that um, we have no patience for inaction. Like, we're not doing it. We're going to solve the problem. We're going to think about upstream. We're going to do, there, we have no patience for people sitting around saying, oh no, what are we going to do? Right? right. But like you always say, it takes a while for those things to then trickle downstream and to, to show themselves. And so in higher education, I think, especially this is such a good motivator because I will tell you back in March, when we started saying to schools, you have this time, from March until August, you have time to make an impact on what's going to happen with your students. And they believed us and they worked their tails off. They called students, they connected with them, they got them resources, they crafted narratives, they worked so hard. And what we're seeing is so many of those schools are at even retention. Some of them are better retention. If they're down, it's just by a little bit. That action made a huge difference. It took a couple of months but they're able to see that their um, applying of their will had this outcome then that was really, really successful. Um, and the other thing I'll say, so back to our uh, Hotel Impossible um, episode, our schools have so much to offer. This hotel had this like, the, and behind their hotel, it was gorgeous. And you were like, hey, can you please fix the fire alarm? and make sure that you have enough flashlights for a storm. Don't mess it up because you have all of this to offer and your action on those things are gonna pay great dividends. Uh, and, and Casey Noble was our designer on that. Um, and Casey was uh, one of my favorites. She's amazing. She did this and then on the side, she did a lot of work. And um, I, I really enjoyed putting her to the test when most of my designers because she always looked at me with a great look like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> and, but she, and because she really did that. Like, like that deck is going to be there forever. Like she really did major construction. It's gorgeous. She, she really did a good job. Okay. One more thing that I want to talk about in our poetry of um, this long break, and that is it's complicated. So just a couple of things for us to consider in terms of co complicated. One thing is that schools, you guys have multiple audiences and I have a lot to say about this. I'm not going to spend very much time on it, but I do want you to think about when you're looking at this long break, you are talking to moms who are concerned about different things, then dads are concerned about different things, then students who wanna hear, here's how we're gonna bring you back and how we're gonna be safe and you, you can have a, a normal college experience. You're talking to staff and faculty who want to make sure that the school and everyone is considering what's happening with them. You have the board and the administration who are trying to figure out if your school can survive if you do things like tuition freezes or decreases or whatever, there are so many audiences as you're thinking about putting your plan in place for the future, um, not just now, but, but uh, in coming semesters. And so um, I was thinking about uh, how we talk to each of these different channels is so important. And the way you know how to talk to them is you figure out what they need to hear. 
So lots to be said about that. I don't know if you want to add something um, about that. But. No, I think you said perfectly. Okay, great. So one more piece of our Hotel Impossible that I want to talk about. This was your first um, engagement with Tammy and it did not go well. And the reason it did not go well is because she thought that, first of all, one big problem is she thought she was the boss, which that's always a problem on Hotel Impossible. Um, also, she thought that she could just not tell the truth about what was going on or say like, we'll talk about that off camera, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. To which you were like, um, no, we're not doing that. We can either tell the truth about the thing or I'm going to leave because that's not how we do this show, right? right. Um, and I walked out. I you did walk out. And what you said, which this is relevant, you said, I'm just trying to talk about a business situation. I'm not trying to fight with her. If she says she won't talk about it, I'm not saying that, I'm leaving. And then you left. And then you, you guys got back together and came around. But I think it's relevant because one of the things she said was like, I'm not comfortable talking about this. And you said, it doesn't make it untrue. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it's going to somehow go away or we can avoid it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I want for our schools to consider because there are some words that make schools, I don't know if you know this, there are some dirty words in um, higher education that the hospitality industry really likes, but we really do not like them. They make us really nervous. Um, we don't like the word hospitality because it feels like we're selling something. We don't like customers or sales because we're not selling anything. We don't like revenue management or client satisfaction because we're not selling anything. We, of course, we are selling something, but we don't like any of those words. We prefer these other words more because it helps us feel like um, we're doing something different than sales. And so... I would just say, these are words about what you're selling and who you're selling to and how much you're selling it for and what the outcome of those sales, these are things that our campuses have to start talking about because the outcome of all of those things is loyalty. We want for our students to be loyal to us. We want for parents to be loyal to us. We wanna do good student development. Um, but we are very squeamish about talking about it in terms of selling a product. So uh, if you don't, if you want to start a fight with somebody in higher education, just tell them that they're selling something and they'll be very unhappy with you. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't want to feel like you're selling me something either. Right. That's right. Because what we would say is there's something intangible, right? There is this other thing, which is like knowledge and relationships and community. I mean, there is something intangible that we're doing there. But um, we do have to think about the business of how we're doing it. And I think that's going to really be challenged um, in the coming uh, time. Okay, two more things I want to talk about. The first one is schools. Please make sure that you understand the difference between in a relationship taking a break and breaking up. So some of your school, some of your students may be taking a break from you because they didn't get what they needed in the fall. And their parents are saying, we want you to stay home and take community college in the spring if they're going to do... Um, online or if they're going to do socially distanced. Um, that doesn't mean they're quitting you. It just means that they're going to take a little break and that you should be working with enrollment management to recapture those students once you can promise the experience that they want, that we could bring them back and they would be part of our community. So she's yeah. not going to find the Italian guy? She is not going to. She's <laughs> just taking a break from you, Anthony. That's all. She'll be back. Um, the other one, though, is breaking up. And this is where she leaves you to go find the Italian. That's She's an like, extreme bye. photo. Wow. Yeah. Bye. I'm leaving you. This is, there will be students who, because of their experience in the fall, academically or socially or whatever their experience was, they will break up with you and they'll decide to go somewhere closer to home or they'll decide to go to a school that's offering something different for something for, for cheaper. Um, I would just say you have a chance to capture those students who have broken up with their other universities. So maybe I was going somewhere far away, I need to come back closer to home. Enrollment management for the school close to home has an opportunity to capture that population. And so you wanna be looking for transfer students who didn't have a great experience at their first institution and, and bring them in and promise them a different experience um, at your institution. You no, know, there's something wrong with me because as you're talking, I'm listening to you. I'm just looking at that picture saying to myself, how long did it take him to roll up those jeans perfectly like that? 
Don't you think he had a stylist whose job that was? He did. Was? <laughs> he did, absolutely. But, but like, I never had a stylist, but I would obsess over that until they were perfect. And I would ask the photographer to take a picture of them to make sure they lined up perfectly. You would get a ruler out and be like, okay, I think it's good. I think we're good to go. <laughs> okay, the last thing that I have for you guys is, uh, this is very hard, but I want us to think about our next normal, which is fall 2021. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of um, presentations on this, but I, I just want campuses for you to be thinking about fall 2021. Here's what your mix is going to be. So you're going to have seniors, um, although, like I said, a lot of seniors are graduating early, so you may have a smaller class of seniors. On campus in the fall, you will have juniors who had one semester of normal, and then they got sent home. Then they had three semesters of crazy. So in their freshman year, they had a semester and then they got sent home, sent home, sent home. They're back to their junior year, right? You will have sophomores who have had two semesters of crazy this fall and spring. And then you will have freshmen who are new to your campus, hoping everything is back to normal, but they will be your first time freshmen that you normally are doing all of your programming for. So in essence, you will have three classifications of students who have never had a normal college experience from fall all the way through to the end of their classification year. So we have to start thinking about what are we gonna do for those groups of students who are gonna be completely new to your campus and kind of regular college life. I don't think it's too early to start thinking about that um, already. So, okay, anything else that you wanna add about our poetic, um, it's complicated, long winter, uh, long distance, uh, perspective, you know, they're, they're, your perspective matters and you can look at it as a long winter. You can look at it as this is really, really tough, or you can look at it that you want to be proud of yourself as, as a faculty member, teacher, parent, student, that you want to come out of this and you want to be stronger and better. And listen, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And this sucks. And I think once you acknowledge it, and like as soon as you show, showed those masks, I literally under my breath said, F those masks, because I'm a mask guy. I'm all about wearing the mask, but I'm so tired of the mask. I was in a place the other day. I had it on for six hours and I'm just so tired of the mask. I know. But, but I'm like, hey, man, I didn't come this far to go this far. Yeah, that's right. So you guys listen, the things that I want you to solve for this break, um, I want you to think about all of those rhythm of the academic year stuff, all that stuff that we would normally be doing. And we need to have a new plan exactly as Anthony said, like things are different. We need to revisit our policies and figure out how to do those things better. Also, I want you to think about long distance stages. So think through each of those stages and how do we seek the antidote to those things for our students? How do we pursue them? How do we plan on our reuniting? How do we make sure that we're looking them in the eyes and saying, I see you, this is really hard. We can't wait to be back together. As always, I have a list of resources for you. So you guys know I'm a big proponent of this book, um, The Art of Community, if you have not read it. This gives you like, here are the seven ways that you build community in on your campus. So this is a great book. Also, Anthony, I don't know that we've talked about this book before, but have you read Upstream? No. You will love this book. That quote came from this book. This is about how we solve problems before they become problems, which you could have written this book, but you'll really like it. Um, my book. I'm done with my book. Now I'm just editing it. You are? Yeah. So when is it, chapters. When is it going to come out? I'd say it's going to come out first quarter of next year. That's exciting. Yeah. Do you, well, okay. Well, what were you going to say? Well, no. so I don't need, can you tell us what the title is? Um, the title is still working on it because um, uh, the person I'm writing with says it's now the title that they want to use. Um, uh, uh, okay, well, we'll it's wait. It's a pretty aggressive title. <laughs> it's something about removing uh, your brain from your, um, yeah. And, yeah. 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 Right. And um, no, but it's basically um, you're your own brand. The most important brand in the world is you. And there's no more important brand in the world than you. So the whole the whole story or the whole book is based on situations I've been in and kind of what you're doing here, breaking down the why. Like people see me like, you know, I'm not an angry guy, right? But people are like, oh, that crazy guy from Hotel Impossible. Everything I do is there's a reason behind it. Nothing is done just to be done. 
Right. Everything is done with a purpose. I mean, and it's really, you do a great job of breaking that down. So in the book, we do the same thing. We break it down and we say, not so much Hotel Impossible, but just my career. It's like, this is what I did. This is the situation I was in. This is why I did it. And then at the end of each chapter, it's kind of like a, like a little um, summary of how you can incorporate that thinking into your brand. Awesome. I love that. That'll be really fun. Um, we have two more meetings this year, and then we will be moving into 2021. Thank goodness. I'm done with 2020. Um, so you guys, please join us the 17th and the 8th um, to talk more with Anthony. And then the things that I always have for you, anticipating your students' needs, you know, we're partnered with Macmillan um, to provide surveys for you about um, what's going on with students. Uh, if you're interested in that, they've made it super affordable. I, I cannot recommend enough um, that you do these surveys and then um, you'll have a good picture of what's going on with students. Did I lie about our meetings, Anthony? Nope. Those, okay. are, those are the meetings on my calendar. Okay. I saw you checking and I was like, oh no, I hope I wasn't lying about no, that. No, I want to make sure they're on my calendar. Right? <laughs> awesome. Hey, thank you so much. I always feel much happier after I've spent time with you. I feel the same way. So uh, thank you for that. You know, I like, I like, uh, 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 to break it down, what I like is I like people that are in reality, like not a fake reality, not a, no, not a depressive reality or overzealous, you know, just this is it, man. And these are the things you can do to solve your problems. And that's it. And, yeah. and you know, and, and I think if we start with, yes, this is not good. However, these are the things we can do to control our lives. And listen, the world is great. We just got to get through it. Yeah, that's it. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's great. Well, I'm going to let you do your tagline because, again, it always makes us feel good. So thank you for spending time with me. And be kind to yourself. Have a great day, you guys. Bye.